uh, which is some exercises uh, we are going to run through. We will look at exercise 5 as well as uh, the exam two years ago to kind of give you some feeling for the level of everything here. Um, we have uh, both today and tomorrow, or at least we had, uh, I have to go to a board meeting tomorrow in Ålesund, so uh, I will try to finish up today. I think that should be feasible, but we may spend the whole day. We will see, okay? That depends on you and your questions and your... So do we have any kind of general questions before we start about this course? EOQ. Yeah, you can use that as a non-sizing approach as long as the demand is certain and it's kind of equal for all. Kind of constant, yeah. But yeah. even if it's not constant, we can still use it as an approximation. You can? Yeah. You can always use it, even if you have a very varying demand. Of course, you can use it, but of course, the more the demand varies, the kind of poorer the solution becomes. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's not illegal to use any kind of model which doesn't fit any kind of reality as an approximation. Of course, we, we do that a lot of times. So that is, that is always an option. Very good question, Jonas. So you must prepare for uh, knowing how to use that, definitely. Of course, what you don't know is that I have already made the exam, so I know the questions. <laughs> and, uh, one way of thinking is, of course, that what, what was given last time may not necessarily be what is given this time. That is, I don't say that it's like that, but uh, it could be, okay? Of course, uh, this stuff, the, the, there's kind of a g limited set of topics we have discussed, okay? And, and something kind of covering all this will be given, but uh, maybe not as focused as, as last year, or two years ago. Any other questions? Not so far. Okay. Maybe after. Maybe after. Okay. So this is assignment five, and of course this is related to the new spoil model. That's kind of uh, the content here. Okay. So then we are in a situation where we have uncertain demand, but we are typically in a situation where we kind of uh, make some purchasing decisions. We should cover some event. And after the event, there is a different price on this object we buy in. It could be food, it could be t-shirts, it could be anything, okay? And uh, this is a kind of situation that we kind of should be interested in if we are interested in events, because it's, it's kind of very convenient when it comes to planning events, because events are very often such that we have high demand uncertainty, but we have to buy stuff before the event starts, okay? We have to make some arrangements, we have to hire up some localities, we have to buy food and so on, okay? And all these kind of decisions must be made. And a newsboy model or newsboy concept could be a nice way of doing this. I don't see it say that it kind of fits everything. And uh, what's typical here is that we kind of don't bring the material from period to period, okay? We kind of make a single buying decision and that should last for our whole event. If we start kind of trying to split our event into parts. Hello, Olivia. Then we will have to open up for the option of storing the object between periods. And this model does not handle that in its simplest form, as we have discussed it. But I have told you that there is more advanced versions who does that, but then it starts getting kind of complicated. So we kind of stick to a relatively simple uh, model frame here. But I think it's important that you kind of understand that this is a kind of model which kind of fits the event situation very good where you kind of uh, make a lot of decisions before the event, involving transactions and money. You run the event, you get some income, and then after the event you, you have something left over. Okay? And these leftovers, they have a different price than when sold during the event. So when you have an event, it's typically a monopoly, of course, and then you can kind of run the price within that, but it typically changes when you kind of end the event. The demand for t-shirts with uh, for the World Cup finals in football with the result is kind of going straight to the bottom immediately after the match. Or not immediately after, but the week after. There is really no demand for it. Okay, so this is the kind of situation we see in, in many events. 
Uh, in this exercise, uh, it says here that an event producer has decided to apply the probability density shown in figure 1. So we have kind of given a probability density here in order to decide his purchase of a certain resource Q. We kind of don't name this, we just say it's a resource, something you want to buy, typically want to sell in your event then. Uh, Q is uncertain demand in the relevant market. So there is some kind of market here, we really don't know and don't need to know what it is. It says in the footnote here that the Q axis can, for instance, be interpreted as percentage of sales ranging from 1-0% to 100%, as we have kind of normed our scale from 0 to 1. So, of course, normally we don't sell objects in that range, do we? We sell 2 or 3 or 5, we don't sell 0 0.2. So, so you can kind of interpret this as a kind of percentage sale, okay? For instance, if you like. In A, it says, fine, the unknown parameter A in the probability density in figure 1. So we start uh, simple, simple here by uh, assuming that you know that any probability density should have, have an area of 1 below its density function. And the density function here is defined on this interval from 0 to 1. And there is a rectangle here and a triangle here. And the, the probability density function is this on the top here, okay? always on the top. This is just kind of helping you to perform the mathematical task. Okay? And we know that the area under a probability density function should equal 1. Okay, that is by definition. If all uncertain outcomes are kind of added together, one of them have to be the case. So with the probability of 1, we, exp uh, we, uh, we, we, we know that, uh, that uh, we kind of cover up all possibilities. So then it's a matter of computing this area, isn't it? And we can split it in two as it's done on the figure here. So if you take A, which is the smallest side of the rectangle and multiply with this distance, which is 1, isn't it? Times 1. Then we have the area of this rectangle and then we add the area of the triangle, which is A times the same distance here, here, here of course, this one equals this one times 1 divided by 2. This should equate to 1 then. Too to preserve the logic, so to speak. And of course this is a, a single equation in one and on A, so we can solve it here. And this is A plus A halves equals 1, or 2, or 3 halves A equals 1, and then we just turn this fraction around to find the solution, so A is 2 thirds. If you multiply by 2 and divide by 3 here on each side of the equation, you can get rid of everything here, and you, the A is alone on the left hand side and it turns out to be 1 times 2, 2 thirds or 2 thirds. So that is the solution to A. Okay, any questions to that? Of course in order to solve this exercise you need to know that the area under the probability density should be 1. Okay, that's the, the, the piece of information which is needed to solve it. And then, of course, you need to know the area of a rectangle as well as the area of a triangle. And presumably, I expect you to do, to do know that. Okay? And uh, I, I also think you really know it. Okay? And if you, if you know the area of a rectangle, then it's easy to, to find the area of a tri triangle, isn't it? Because uh, if you know this area, then it's just to draw a line here. Of course, this one is the same size as that one. So to find the area of this one is just the total area divided by 2. Okay, so it's that's straightforward in principle. Then it says in B, find a mathematical expression for the probability density on the form of equation 311 or 312 in the textbook. And there, then, then we have a kind of form. And the idea then is, is simply to, to establish the mathematical function of this straight line here. Okay? Yeah. We should know, shouldn't we, at least from other courses, that a straight line K 
can free the spirit like this y equals a plus bx okay and what we what we want to do now is to try to find this a and this b which corresponds with this function and we have now found that a equals two thirds okay so we can draw we can draw over a line can't we it starts yeah, I tend to, of course, we can put zero here if you like, if you're more familiar with that. And it goes up to one, and there's a straight line here, which goes down to a point there, okay? This distance is known, isn't it? It's two-thirds. And if we draw the line here, of course, this is two-thirds, and this is two-thirds, so the, the total distance up here is four-thirds, isn't it? This one is four thirds. Based on this information, we can find two points, can't we? We can find this point. This point starts at zero and ends at four, four thirds. So this is this point zero, four thirds. We can also find this point, can't we? And we only need two points to find a line. Okay. So what is this point? It starts at 1 and it ends at 2 thirds. Then, based on these two points, we know that our line should run through these two points. So if we enter each of the points, we get two equations to find the unknowns A and B. So, if this is point 1 and this is point 2, let's start with point 1. And in point 1, x, if this is the x-axis as normal, and this is the y-axis then, if you want to use these terms, then x is 0 at this point, while y is 4 thirds. So that's just to enter. So 4 thirds should equal a plus b times 0, okay? Do the same with the other point, but in that point x is 1, y is 2 thirds, then it's 2 thirds equals a plus b times 1. Of course you can write this easier, 4 thirds equals a a, and here it's 2 thirds equals a plus b. Now it's uh, easy, isn't it? We ha have the value for a, so we can just take this input there to find b. Okay. Then we get 2 thirds equals 4 thirds plus b. And b turns out to be 2 thirds minus four thirds, which should be minus two thirds, shouldn't it? That's b, and a is four thirds. We should expect a negative b here, shouldn't we? Because the angle here goes from up to down. Okay. The other way around, we would have a positive b. This way should be a negative b. More, li more or less like a demand curve, as we discussed it in, in the event economics course. So this is the answer on Exercise B. To be able to solve this, yes? Uh, let's say on an Excel, do you have to do it mathematically to show you, or can we just describe it by looking at the graph as we would one? No, in this case, you will have to need these numbers, don't you? To kind of, so you, you need actually to find them here. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's always a good idea to, to kind of write what you think. But in this case, I'm actually asking to find it, and then you, you should find it, okay? Yeah, because it's needed as you move along here. You actually need these numbers to, to find the, 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 the next step here, which is the probability density function, I believe. But we, we kind of haven't finished yet, have we? You should perhaps write it up in the form of equation 311 and 312. So let's do that. Okay. Because now our 
formula is given, isn't it? Now we can uh, we have found a and b, so we have y equal to a, which was four thirds minus two thirds b. So this is the kind of expression. But to kind of define this mathematical function on this on the on the on the figure here, we kind of need to write it up a little bit more exact. So then, if we use the term capital Q, then which is kind of given in the exercise here. We could, could say that if uh, it should obviously be this part, 4 thirds minus 2 thirds, and then it should not be B here, sorry, it should be X, shouldn't it? And now I've substituted X with capital Q, haven't I? And this is if X is, and I use this term, which means in the interval from 0 to 1, isn't it? In that case, our probability density function looks like this straight down sloping line. Outside of this area there is nothing, so it's zero. Okay? So it's zero else where. So this is actually the final answer to exercise B. Am I doing this too involved? Should I do it faster or is this okay? Do you like this kind of speed? Okay. The next question is to find the distribution function. Of course, then we need to know the connection between a probability density and the distribution function. And we have discussed that in this course. And as you may remember, this capital F OQ equals the integral from zero in the case that we have defined our distribution starting with zero up to a variable Q O this F OQ DQ and F OQ is defined here now. So in order to, to do this we need to know how to perform the integration. Okay, that is necessary. When we do integration, we normally do it in a two-step process first we find the value of the indefinite integral so we kind of start here of course we start of course this is the thing we should use we don't care about this one it's kind of outside so uh, so implicitly here we, we kind of assume doesn't we that q is less than or equal to 1 okay that is kind of an implicit assumption and uh, there is no probability outside here so it, it doesn't really matter but uh, if we start by performing this operation, f o q d q, then we can enter this expression for f o q. So now we, do, we kind of take out these limits first to kind of find the mathematical expression. Then finally, when we have found that, we can kind of enter the upper and lower limit to find the actual final result. So it's 4 thirds minus 2 thirds q. And we tend to write it like this. And the idea, as we discuss now, is to kind of find what function has this as a derivative, isn't it? That is, we do the opposite of differentiation when we do integrals. And then we tend to put this sign, we interchange when we kind of perform the operation. So 4 thirds q is a function which we take the derivative of this one, we will get 4 thirds. So that is performing indefinite integration on the first part of this function. Then we do it on the second part. Then we need 4 thirds q squared, don't we? Because the derivative of this one is 2 times, no, sorry, this was not correct, was it? Must be 1 here, shouldn't it? Because now I can take 2 times the third is 2 thirds times q to 2 to the power of 2 minus 1, which is 1. Okay, So this is the result of performing this operation. And then I must enter the lower limit and the upper limit. And the way you do it is that you enter the upper limit first, then you subtract entering the lower limit. And we see immediately here that by entering the lower limit, this is 0 and this is 0, so it vanishes. Okay, So you end up with capital FOQ, 
by only entering the upper limit, which is of course the same as this expression, isn't it? So it's 4 thirds q minus 1 third q squared. And this is the answer to question C. Questions? So far, we've only done mathematics, haven't we? There has been kind of no logistics so far. This is only mathematics. It could just as well have been a course in, in calculus. In principle, OK? Let's move on. Would you consider his choice of probability density as optimistic or pessimistic? What do you think about that? The answer is pessimistic. And the reason is that the distribution here has kind of more probability closer to zero here. Of course, if this is sales, you would like to sell mo a lot, OK? That is typical, isn't it? So when you have this kind of distribution, there's a la greater probability that you sell little than that you sell more. So in that sense, we could say that it's pessimistic if it had been the other way around, something like that, then of course there will be higher probability to sell more. So the answer there was pessimistic. Any questions to that? No. Then we come to question E. Assume now that Cu equals Co equals C and give a practical interpretation of the meaning of this assumption. That was perhaps not so easy to understand what you should do here. But when you get this information, you should kind of couple this to the basic outcome in a new spoil model. And the basic outcome is a formula, isn't it? And that formula looks like this. Now, the distribution function where we enter the optimal purchase amount should equal a fraction. And that fraction involves these CUs and COs. Of course, as you can use the textbook, you don't really need to remember this. And I always forget wha what should be on the top of the fraction here. So let me just have a check. Let's see if I can find it. Yeah. Looks like the CU over CU plus CO. Okay. Now we got some extra piece of information here, didn't we? We say assume now that this one equals this one. Of course, the first thing to do then is to use that information, isn't it? So if CU equals CO, then this fraction changes, doesn't it? Because then I can can enter CU for CO here, for instance. Then the fraction is Cu over Cu plus Cu, isn't it? Because Cu equals Co. And this is one Cu, and here is two Cu, and we can get rid of the Cu, so we end, end up with our distribution function equaling a half. Now if you know some probability theory, which I'm not sure you do, then the equation we end up with now is the definition of the so-called median. Have you heard about the median? Yeah. yeah, it's kind of the midpoint, as opposed to the average or the expected value, which is not necessarily the midpoint. But uh, we are not kind of asked to inter infer that here, but we are kind of ask to give a practical interpretation of the meaning of this expression. The practical imp implement interpretation should be simple here. 
What this means is kind of the, the cost of buying too much equals the cost of buying too little. That's what it means. Okay, so we are, we are kind of indifferent between these two. You remember that in the examples we looked at previously, we got numbers here who were kind of larger than a half, so we kind of overbooked. Of course, in this case, you kind of enter the midpoint. And if our distribution is symmetric, then the median equals the expected value. This, this can be proved mathematically, but you have to trust me. Okay, so, so if our FOQ had been symmetric, which is in fact it isn't here, okay? It's not symmetric, this one, is it? A symmetric distribution is this kind of distribution or this kind of distribution, but here it's skewed to one part, so this is not symmetric. But if it had been, then this information would provide an extremely simple way of solving newsboy problems. Because then you could just find the expected value in your distribution and that would be your solution. Okay? We're trying to find the median here. If the median equals the expected value, then of course you know the solution. So this is a kind of simplified way of solving newsboy problems given that CU equals CCO. But normally CU shouldn't equal CO. Okay, that's that's what it should. But in this case, the median does not equate expected value because the distribution is not symmetric. And then we must kind of run through the way of solving stuff as we have learned. So this is kind of the practical interpretation here. And, and the, the answer I was searching for there was kind of uh, this CU, you just transform that into, into what it means. The same for the CO, the cost of ordering too much, the cost of ordering too little. And if they equal, then you kind of run into a special case where you always end up with this fraction on the right hand side as a half. And then in F we are asked to actually find this Q star, okay? Find the optimal because what does it say? Find the event producer's optimal purchase quantity for the given resource. Okay, now we have to use this this uh, FOQ we found and equate it to a half and solve that equation. Okay, that's what we're asked for. I could have made this easier by making a symmetric distribution instead. In that case, you would have found the solution directly without actually calculating it. But now we have to use our FOQ and solve the equation which I just wiped out here. So F O Q star should equal a half and F O Q star was for third Q star, wasn't it? Minus or plus? I don't remember. Minus four was it four third? One third, wasn't it? One third. Yeah. one third q star squared equals half. So we have to solve a quadratic equation here to find the solution. Okay? And of course then to be able to do that you need to know the formula. And if you have this equation here a x squared plus b x plus c equal to zero. You can always drag it on the left hand side to get to zero on the right hand side. You should remember that x equals minus b plus minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. So if you, if you remember this form, of course, then you have to be able to pinpoint the different values here. And it, it's kind of straightforward here, isn't it? Because you can write it like minus a third q star squared as the first one, and you add 4 third q star as the second one, then you have the x square and the x, and then you move that to the left hand side so you get minus a half equals zero. So a equals minus a third, b equals plus four thirds, and c equals minus a half. Then you have all the information you need to enter into this formula. 
Unfortunately, of course, when you, when you solve a quadratic equation, you get two solutions. And there, there, there's kind of a question here which one of them should be the correct one. In most cases, that kind of runs by itself, because when you compute, you find that one is kind of inside this area, another one is outside. The one which is outside the area is, of course, the one, not the one we're looking for. At this point, I just go at the solution. I think, yeah, there we ended up with the same answer here. That's good. Uh -uh. We had that equation, yes. Uh, and then I did a little bit moving from a equation A to equ equation 9 here. I did some slight manipulations. I multiplied by 6 on each side of 8 here first. So when I multiply by 6 here, I can reduce 6 divided by 3. Is 2. 2 times 4 is 8. So I get minus 8 here when I kind of write it in the correct direction. Uh, 6 over 3 is 2, so I get minus, which is changed sign when I kind of rearrange here into 2q squared. And 6 divided by 2 is 3. So you see, I, uh, I get different stuff here, don't I? But that doesn't matter, does it? Because I can always multiply by minus 1 here. And then I, I would change the signs. So the signs, so, so the, what's, what, what I'm saying here is absolutely correct. An alternative way would to use these numbers. And most students prefer perhaps single numbers instead of fractions. Because there we ended up with fractions, didn't we? Minus a third, four thirds, and minus a half. As long as you have an equation, you can always change the fractions into numbers by just multiplying with that. Common denominator, which of course is 3 times 2, which is 6 here. And then you can add these numbers 2 for A, minus 8 for B, plus 3 for C, again into this one to produce the final solution here, which turns out to be q star equals to 2 plus minus the square root of 2.5. And it says further on there, clearly only the root 2 minus square root of 2, 2, 2.5 makes sense, because 2 plus this will of course be far outside our interval. 2 plus a positive number would be larger than 1, wouldn't it? So we have to look at the root which contains the minus sign here. So this is the only sensible root, and it turns out to be around 0 0.42. So the final conclusion here is that the Q star should equal 0 0.42. So we don't order half the amount here, which would be a half, wouldn't it? And we have moving from 0 to 1 mid in between would be a half. We order slightly under here. And the reason is, of course, that it's kind of pessimistic here. It kind of moves to the left hand side. So instead of buying more, we buy slightly less 0 0.08 less, actually. So the decision problem of this event arranger or producer is kind of solved. Now. Given that all this information is correct, then he, he had found a solution. He should order 0 0.42 something. Whatever. Okay. Okay. Was there anything else? This was F, wasn't it? And then there is a, a G question. Yeah, that's kind of following up what I already have said, isn't it? Given our assumption of C U equals C O equals C, what would you state on possible answers? to question E, if the probability density had been symmetric. In that case, if it had been, the order quantity would be a half, wouldn't it? Yeah. So the answer would be straightforward then. There are in fact two other kind of extreme cases here, isn't it? If you look at this, this fraction here, I think it was like this, wasn't it? Now we looked at the situation where this one equals that one. But we could also ad identify two other situations. One situation if Cu is very much larger than Co. What would happen then? If Cu is very much larger than this one, this one vanishes, doesn't it? So then you end up with Cu over Cu, which is 1. Okay. Alternatively, we could look at Co much larger than Cu. If this is the major number, 
if this is given something, then of course you get a certain number divided by a very large number. So it would, would move towards zero. So in this case, the fraction would be one. In this case, the fraction would be zero. So in those cases, of course, you, kind of, you can read out the solution directly. As, as the kind of lower point or the upper point. Okay? Okay. Then there was another assignment, assignment two in this case. In the table here, we have given a set of costs of different locations as well as a set of qualities. The costs are named CY and the quality of each location is named QI. And on the top row, we have just numbered each location. And it says here that the arranger can, uh, yeah, table one contains loca location data for an event arranger wanting to pick a single location for an event. So now we have kind of one artist and you want to assign these artists to one of these seven possible locations. The arranger can pick one of seven possible locations, each with a cost CI and a quality attribute QI. And then there's a question. Suppose the local police says that the quality of the event location at least must be six. What location should the event arranger pick? Yeah, the first thing you, you should know now is that based on this information, this exercise is not solvable. Okay? And the reason is that we haven't stated anything about the preferences of the event arranger. We need to state that, okay? If we have added the event arranger wants to minimize costs, then it would be easy to solve, at least easier. We need that pref preference information. And of course, if you get these kind of exercises, you should, you should write that, okay? Uh, we, we, need to, uh, we need some information related to the preferences of the event arranger. And uh, one way of doing that could, for instance, be to say that he's greedy, he wants to minimize costs, okay? So given that that is out of the way, then we can start looking at this, can't we? And we are actually asked to find the exact location here, isn't it? And if we want to pick the cheapest location, which has a quality of at least six, then of course we can al already see that we can rule out something, can't we? Uh, these one, five, six, and one, they don't, and three, they don't have enough quality, do they? So we don't need to look at those. So we have this one left, which has six, this, this one left, which has seven, this is cheaper. So comparing two and four, we would pr prefer two, wouldn't we? Because it's cheaper. So then that one is out, and then there is only one left, which is seven. It has, it satisfies our constraint of quality, but it's more expensive than two. So the optimal solution is straightforward here, just by inspection. Okay. And that was what I intended you to do here, just to inspect it, not start doing using lingo here, okay? So exercise 2A, location 2 is optimal. It is cheapest for the given quality demand. Okay, that should be simple, as long as you know what to do, of course, which always may be a problem. But if you're in doubt about what to do, do what is easiest. Normally that is what I have intended. So uh, in general, that's a good strategy, okay? So if you kind of, what is he thinking I should do here? Do what seems easiest for you, okay? Then it says further on here. As after some strong negotiations with the police and local politicians, the event arranger has been allowed to downgrade the quality demand from the original 6 to 5.5. This is the kind of thing you can see in reality. Typically when it comes to fire stuff, okay, you need certain 
fire quality to be allowed to 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 to, to run an event uh, and it could be that you can kind of argue here okay if i give a little bit more events maybe you can take the fire demands a little bit down and that's kind of the situation which has happened here so it's it's the politicians have kind of made a, an exception and that's what we have politicians for isn't it to make exceptions from the rules even though we don't like it okay that should be taken out the video <laughs> uh, uh, so now they have kind of come up with a deal here okay uh, so if the event arranger commits to to run three events instead of one he's allowed to take the quality down to 5.5 on average okay so then we need to know what the meaning of all, all average is of course it's just adding together three location qualities and divide by three okay that is which now is kind of go moving down from six to five point five given that he arranged three events in parallel yes he has also been promised a certain subsidy if he chooses this option instead of his original choice so implicitly here we could expect perhaps that this uh, option is not as good for the ar event arranger as the original one by, by the wording in the text here okay but this is kind of what we should discuss in the text and then in B it says formulate a mathematical programming model for this new negotiated situation. And this is an assignment model, isn't it? Because now it's not only one, but now it's three artists which should be assigned to three locations, chosen out of seven possible ones. Okay. So if we look at the solution here. <coughs> the model is given here. No, sorry. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Yeah. So this is really not an assignment mode. Sorry about that. It's, it's kind of simple because we don't have to double sum here. We, we still have... We, we can kind of guarantee three artists by, by adding this constraint 13, can't we? So our total cost here is the same as before. We add together these binary variables multiplied by the Cs to get the total cost. So each time we put values into the deltas, we get different costs. But uh, by adding this constraint 13 here, we kind of secure that three artists are picked, okay? And this 14 takes care of the average quality, doesn't it? It's perhaps easier to see if you kind of take this number 3 and put it on this side. Because then it says one third times the sum of delta i q i should be larger than or equal to Q bar. This Q bar should equal 5.5 by the way, shouldn't it? That's the demand. And this is the average demand given that this one holds, isn't it? Because this, this function would, would compute all possible averages of all three combinations or locations. So as long as this one holds, this one will only pick up three locations and compute the average for each of them. And the only thing I've done here, which we in many cases do is to kind of move the tree on the right hand side of course when you multiply by three you don't have to change the tree is a positive number so you don't have to change the inequality signs direction and of course these deltas should be zero or one and it says further on in the end here that this q bar is 5.5 that was given i equals seven that's the total number of locations and the ci's and qi's are given in this table then we have all the information we need to put this into lingo. Okay, let's look, look back on the, on the text here and say what it says. So now we have formulated the mathematical programming model, so that is done. Okay, and then it's a question on solving it. Okay, before we solve it, we can try to look for some solutions, could we, to see if we can find a feasible solution. Now, if we look at the qualities here, if we, if we add this three number, if I take seven plus six plus three, I get 16, don't I? 16 divided by three, how much is that? Yeah, that's below. So we cannot include the three, can we? We can see that immediately. That this one can be taken out, okay? Uh, if I take, 6 plus 6 plus 5, that's 17. 
divided by 3, how much is that? That's 5 point, Six. above 5.5, 5, isn't it? So there is, and uh, that is com combining 6, 6 and 5 produces a feasible solution. It costs 16 plus 9 plus 15. Okay. Of course, I can substitute any of the 6s with a 7. If I do that, but there is no force here, okay, so I cannot add that. So that opens up for some options here. Uh, I can perhaps also substitute the 5 by 7, can't I? That would also run. So we see some feasible solutions here. If you look at the, the solution text here, I, I just pick up some here, okay? In order to solve this problem, we can try some trial and error, okay? It is, for instance, easy to observe a feasible solution of L327. Uh, that is, oh, this is sorted, isn't it? Maybe it's better to go at the, the text. 3, 2, 7, 6, 5, 6. Okay, we identified that. Of course, you can substitute this 5 by any of the other two 5s. So you see that there's kind of a big uh, number of pos potential solutions. But we, we kind of identified this 3, 2, 3, 2, 7 solution as the average quality of this solution is 5 plus 6 plus 6, which is 5.67, which is above 5.5. However, this is not necessarily the optimal solution. Another one, 5 to 7, is for instance cheaper. So to be on the safe side, let us solve this problem in Lingo, okay? A, of course, you can always pick all possibilities here, but it kind of becomes a fair amount of possibilities when you are to pick 3 out of 7. Do you know how to compute the number of possibilities? Have you seen this? Have you seen this construct before? A binom binomial coefficient, for instance, 7 over 3. You have seen this, Jonas. Do you know how to compute it? No, I've seen it. Oh, you do it like this. You take 7 faculty divided by 3 faculty times 7 minus 3 faculty. But you haven't seen this. Okay, it doesn't matter. But the, the point is, it's, it's relatively easy to compute the number of, of possibilities in this simple setting. But uh, it, it's really not the point here. So, we use Lingo. And we should perhaps try to blow this up a little bit. Uh, you can see here the actual model I used. Uh, I introduced then seven binary variables called D1 up to D7 here. And then I just add these costs from the table in the objective. 10, 15, 14, 28, 9, and 16. And then, of course, I have to add these constraints, picking out three of them, which is the second one, D1 plus, and so on, up including D7 equals 3. Okay, that's the second one. And then finally, the, the quality constraint. I just take uh, the qualities, multiply them with each of the binary variables, and it should equal 3 times 5.5. 3 times 5.5 should be 16.5, shouldn't it? Yeah, so that's you see. And of course, finally, you have to define all the variables as binary, and then you can solve the, the problem by just hitting this uh, target here. And um, the solution comes out. It turns out that it's a combination of location 1, location 4, and location 6, which is the cheapest satisfying the quality, the average quality demands. You can see that here, can't you? D1 is 1, D4 is 1, and D6 is 1. So it's 1, 4, and 6. If we go back, we can check whether it is correct. 1, 4, and 6. 1 is 5, 4 is 7, 6 is 5. Okay, so I kind of substitute it by using 7 and add this, do these two 5s. Uh, 5 plus 5 plus 7 is 17 divided by 3, which is five points above, yeah. So that was the optimal solution in these cases. And the idea here was, was perhaps to kind of show you by, by a more clear example that it's not so easy to actually pick the solution. It was easy in the first part of the exercise, but it's not so easy when you kind of open up for more possibilities. Of course, the more locations you have, the more you need to kind of pick out of within that set, the, the larger the opportunities become. 
Okay, we just finished this one before we take a break. So we have done C. And then we come to D. Should the event, sorry, a typo there, event arranger be happy with this new solution? What level is needed for the subsidy? Do you have an enough information to answer this question? Discuss. And an open type of question, which kind of should implicate that maybe the answer is not obvious here. We can, of course, start by looking at the costs here, okay? What has happened to the cost part? Um, in the first case, uh, maybe we could just go to the solution here. Oh, that was... Yeah, this was, maybe I can, yeah, this works. Yeah. Okay. It says it, uh, that, that this one is unfor unfortunately harder to solve, uh, however, uh, yeah. The, the point here is that we, we don't have any information about what happens to the mod, okay? If I am to keep one event, then I would expect a certain number of people. But the demand here is that I should run three. Maybe I should run three with the same artist. That could lead to degrades in demand on each of the three locations, so I get less audience, at least on each of them. Of course, if I'm a little bit lucky, I might be able to get a little bit more as a total. But on average, for each event, it will probably be lower than by just keeping one. Okay? So you, you see there is some impact on the revenue side here, which we have no information on. On the cost side, however, we can, we can say something, can't we? The ne negotiated solution involves arranging three events at a total cost of 39, which is the cost in the optimal solution, or an average of 13 for each. This is cheaper than the original one, which cost us 15, okay? But still, we have to run these three, of course, even though if it's on average is cheaper, we need at least on average to have the same amount of demand to cover the costs, you agree? and that we have no information about. Or if we are reasonable, we would expect that to be hard. At least I would do that. Of course, if the politicians give us some other artists, so you, can, you can use this one and this one in addition to your original one, then of course it could be a, quite a different story, because that, those artists could have different market segments, and you could get more audience totally, as well as on average. So this is a question on the so-called demand links, as I told them. As it says in the end here, however, in reality, demand effects must be considered. Typically, cannibalism. You know what that is? Cannibalism, you know what that is. Yeah. If you eat people, then you're a cannibal, okay? It doesn't mean eating people, but in a sense it does. It means that you self-eat people by spreading your activity into several events, then you kind of just distribute your customers on these events instead of kind of get gaining more. That is what we refer to as cannibalism in log logistics. It's a kind of an important term. Uh, you can think about this college, okay? We have certain study programs and we have some students applying for this. When we judge to launch a new program, then there is cannibalization, don't we? Because if we, if we launch a very nice logistics program, the students who primarily would have applied for the other ones suddenly move to this one. So we get less students on the old ones. So the idea, the clue is, of course, to, to make a different product, which kind of attracts a different part of the market. So you sell it to some other students than the ones you already have, okay? This is the, the concept of cannibalism. So. so cannibalism is very important when it comes to event arrangements, okay? It's, it's, it's there all the time. When the jazz festival here, runs a lot of parallel events, of course there's cannibalization. There's a kind of a given amount of people around here. Uh, and uh, if you kind of put too many arrangements in here, you just increase the cost without actually increasing the revenue. So, so th this is kind of dangerous. The idea is, as always, to try to construct products which are kind of not substitutes. Okay? They have to be different artists, different uh, concerts, whatever. Okay? To not uh, kind of compete with yourself. That's another way of defining cannibalism. Taking average revenues down and the need for an actual subsidy may emerge. Okay, so we can kind of accept that these kind of negotiations could include a subsidy. The size of it, however, is very hard to say anything about. Then we need to actually have these demand consequences on numbers. Because then we could, we could 
compare the two solutions. Then we can take the first solution with a single event, solve that, find the optimal location, find the number in the audience, multiply with the price and take the difference to kind of find the, the profits. Then we could do the same in the second case, where we are kind of forced to hold three events, do exactly the same and compare and pick the largest. Okay. Or alternatively, we could say to the politicians, we have made our calculations. We have found out that we need a subsidy, oh, that much, unless we will stick to the old plan. Okay. Yeah. So this was the end of exercise five, and it's time for a break. Unless you have some questions. Okay, then there's break time.